recording. So good. Good afternoon, brothers. Uh, it's good to see you all today, and I want to thank you all for joining us, uh, joining you know this 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 platform as we uh, have a conversation about Father's Day. I have a conversation about what I've called um, the measure of a man. Uh, I, I like this show that's on television now. It's called The Council of Dads. Do you all take a, ever seen that show? It's a new show on television. I've seen one or two. Episodes. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. I understand the concept. First, in the, a lot can happen in, in one night, but um, it's a it's a pretty neat 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 show, and I like I enjoy uh, watching it. But um, Larry, brother Larry Major, going to join us shortly. There he is. Okay, admit. Camera, point your camera down. Um. Yeah, Larry, point your camera down, brother. There you go. There you go. There he is. There yeah. Go. yeah, yay. Smile. <laughs> oh, smile. Okay, here we go. Ah! Okay, good. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Let us, uh, let's have a word of prayer. God, I, I thank you for this, this time together with my brothers. Thank you, Lord, for um, just allowing an opportunity to meet with them via a Zoom platform. We ask now, God, that your um, power and the presence of your Holy Spirit uh, come in our midst and be our strength and our guide and lead our conversation as we talk about Father's Day and tribute to Father's Day, as we talk about the measure of a man uh, in honor of our sons and fathers and uncles and cousins. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. Uh, bless the home that we all represent, and be with us now as if we have this conversation. It's such a very difficult time of uh, this pandemic, and a difficult time doing this racial unrest and a new movement in Black Lives Matter. Uh, we thank you, God, and this, your servant's prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. 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 Um, amen. Um, again, welcome this afternoon. Won't we'll keep you long. We'll try to do it in part one and part two. But as I was thinking uh, some time ago, dads, fathers, um, in my book, have always been uh, number one, and they come in many forms: uncles, brothers, cousins, friends, church members, fraternity brothers. Um, we're, we're teachers, doctors, lawyers, laborers. You know. Or, or, wide variety of professions. Um, we help brothers, we help our families, our sons, our daughters, we help lead them to love. We, we mentor us to them, we mold them, we, we, we model for them, uh, especially for the men. We model um, manhood and what man sh men should be. Uh, godly, godly, uh, in a godly way. And I always say that we are, or you all are the Superman without the cape. Amen? Amen. You, are the super, you are the Superman without the cape. And Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King says this in a quote. He says, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Amen? Amen. And I'm gonna put that up, but uh, one of my uh, one of my father's favorite scripture uh, growing up that he used to always quote was uh, Proverbs three and five, eleven. Trust in the Lord and lean not thine own understanding, and in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. And because that was my father's uh, favorite uh, scripture, it's become my favorite scripture. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, what, what got me to thinking about the measure of a man, uh, oftentimes I'm around brothers who are working on homes or working on projects, and I notice how um, meticulous they are with they are. measuring things, and, and they'll measure three or four times, but they'll cut once. And I thought about it as, as men, uh, sometimes one mistake can be devastating. Amen? But um, we're, we're men, we're builders, we're engineers, or we like to, um, part of our jobs uh, is part of our personality. And so um, I want to just have this conversation, the measure of a man. So I'm going to open up this question to uh, 
who would want to start off, if you, I thought about this, if you knew then what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? Uh, if you know then what, uh, what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? So open that up to whoever wants to go first. Pastor, I'm, I'm going to lead on this one, brothers, uh, reverend, pastors, docs, everybody. Yeah. It, it, yes, if, <laughs> here's the deal. Uh, you better go to church, boy, and quit playing hooky from it. You know? <laughs> Yes, Go sir. And, and, and sit your butt down and learn what it's all about. That's mm -hmm. all I say now. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 my advice to my younger son should have listened to my father. Mm. My father and I had a contentious relationship that really didn't resolve until I was probably in, in seminary and I was in my 30s by then. Mm -hmm. Uh -oh. All right. I'm sorry. I got it. You go on okay. track there. All right. Praise God. Um, but uh, he told me when I finished college, he, he told me that I should go and study education and be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I didn't listen to him. And then look, I, I end up coming out a teacher all these years later. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, Many, many times I thought about all the other things he said. I wished I had listened, but we had a, it was almost like as soon as he said something, I, I wouldn't, you know, because we did have this contentious relationship. Right. And, uh, but, but praise God, uh -huh. in later years that resolved and we became quite close. Right. Amen. And so when he was called on to be with the Lord, I had just, you know, we were, we were very good father, son, very good friends. And I had just spoken to him by phone. And uh, and he was, you know, we, we just had a good laugh. And so anyway, I wish I had listened to him. I would, I would advise myself to listen to him more than I did. Now, That's good. now I don't want to go on, but I just want to say sometimes, you know, we all have to follow our own path. And I don't know, had I listened to him and done it the way he said, Maybe uh -huh. I wouldn't have had the success. Of, maybe I needed to fall on my face for myself. Right. You yeah. know, you oh, that's, a, that's a flip the wall. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I love that because, <clears throat> you know, that's a, a very important relationship. And I've once heard that most of us find ourselves trying to uh, impress our father in one way or the other, get his, seek his approval. Mm -hmm. That's true. So that's, you know, I, I, what I heard from my father, and I want to answer this question. Go ahead. And you kind of threw me when you were saying these things, but uh, he, he, his father died when he was three months old. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was in high school, I would have to start a week or two to be able to, to get the car for a date. <laughs> And uh, one day I just confronted him when I was getting close because, you know, it was a pretty girl and she was saying, okay, what time are you going to pick me up? And I hadn't got a confirmation from him yet. Well, I had to confront him and he says, son, I didn't have a father growing up. My grandfather raised me and I had to drop out of school in the sixth grade to, mm -hmm. to, to take care of my grandparents and the farm that big old place. He said, I apologize. You deserve an answer. And from then on, you know, we were cool. Um, it just, I just understood why he always said, I want you to be educated. He told mm -hmm. all our kids that. Okay. Um, so one of the things, if I were looking back and I had to speak to my younger self, I would say, hey, Lamaris, you need to stare fear in the face and just go all out and cock it. Because uh, I was pretty good at most things I accomplished. But you know, when you're around a bunch of peers that some had great athletic ability, some had good, I kind of fit up there usually in the five and 10% on all these things. 
And it was difficult for me to realize what my passion was. I always had a love for science, but I just wasn't sure. And I was a somewhat introverted, shy fellow. But it wasn't until I got up around these guys that I was competing with, the guys I grew up with, that I realized, wow, you're finishing top, you're finishing second, you're finishing third. So if I had to go back, I'd say, man, and I probably, it, it took a, a, a English class where I had to do, play a major role in a Julius Caesar play. No. Uh, with a, a English lit person who just made me come out of my shell. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. I had to recite this thing and she kept shouting in the class, I want that voice to knock the wall down. <laughs> <This class. laughs> you need to knock the wall down. Stop acting so shy. <laughs> I finally came out of that thing. Yeah. Um, it helped. And, uh, you know, when you get older, you realize how blessed you are to be yeah. surrounded with that type of teachers and folk. And I try to tell my son, I said, it wasn't that uh, we necessarily wanted integration for the be with folks. We just wanted the tools that we could develop our folks. And uh, uh, that's, that's the thing that stick with me, you know, because we had some really talented folks growing up and we were really nurtured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, this is Larry. Um, as I look back on the 61 years of my life, one of the things that, that, that I look at where I hadn't been successful is in marriage. I've uh, been married twice, and growing up, I was able to see my mother and father every day when I came home. My children didn't get to enjoy that. It was, it was segmented. They got to see daddy during the summer and they got to see mama all the other times. And so now they didn't, they didn't enjoy that. So, so why did the divorce happen? I don't know. Um, if, if I could figure out the mind of a female, I'm pretty sure I'll be a zillionaire, uh, but I can't. I, I just know that um, when I originally was married the first time, I was pretty dogmatic. I was trying to be the best naval officer I probably I possibly could, so I didn't take my uniform off when I went home. And I, I kept it on and, and I was, you know, barking out orders and my ex-wife, <laughs> Lord knows she didn't she wasn't playing that radio. So um it, it's, I look back on my younger self. One of the things I would tell me is lighten up. Smell the roses and listen to what that woman is saying and do at least half of what she's saying, which would have been hard. But anyway, that's what I tell him. I guess um, I get so. back off the last three people that commented. Um, if I were able to go back in the past and tell myself a few things that I learned, the first would probably be to study change, um, to know that it's coming and understand the characteristics of change. Um, the other things would probably be, like the last gentleman said, um, understanding relationships in a deep manner, um, actually spending a lot of time before you get in them, um, reading and um, really understanding um, the male-female relationships. A lot of times we spend more time getting our driver's license uh, you know, in this country than we do actually getting our license to get married. Yeah. Um, There's no option there, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the other thing is is the the purpose, just really listening um, to my dad. Um, we ended up being in two different churches. I don't think that was a, a great help, but um, that made it a little harder to tune in um, and really get that purpose that you need from your father. Like, um, I guess uh, I didn't remember his name, but his father kind of talked to him about purpose and what it really is um, and what it really means. And um, other than that, you know, that's what I go back and tell myself. 
Well, I'm gonna weigh in. <laughs> Can I take a turn? Um, yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to kind of stay on that track that these brothers have have started uh, with Calhoun kicking it off about his relationship with his dad. Um, and I recall a similar kind of relationship. Mine had more to do with the fact that I interpreted my father's uh, meekness as weak. And um, so I was going to, you know, start out my life, as they say, taking no prisoners. <laughs> and so uh, I learned that that was a quiet strength that he had. And since my father was uh, self-employed and contractor and, and really refused to be under the employment of anyone else, um, he encouraged me to get my education, but he also encouraged me to have a plan so that I could secure uh, a level of independence if I needed to say, uh, see you later to somebody uh, that I didn't really want to work for. And uh, so the thing that I would probably stress to my younger self is um, just invest more. Um, even though I've been able to do just what dad recommended that I should do is preserve a level of independence. Uh, I would still say because, you know, he grew up on the rough side of the mountain. Uh, and we experience economic scarcity uh, that, that if I were, if I were speaking, speaking to my younger to my self, younger self, even if it was putting a very small, small amount on side, side every, every month, month, every paycheck, every check, whatever, whatever uh, that, uh, I, that I, would, I, would, I would try to try invest, invest more aggressively, more aggressively, aggressively uh, than I did, than I did in my younger, younger years. Reverend, you're yes. muted. Thank you, sir. Uh, Reverend Taylor, you had a little echo in there, so you might want to check your your audio. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's still doing a little echo. Um, so what 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 do you think has been your you all's greatest challenge in your life? This in the past or now or you might want to share anything. Your greatest challenge to this uh, in the journey. Go ahead, Doc. I was just going to say figuring it out, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was such a late bloomer. I'm, I'm just still amazed how, you know, <laughs> I just feel like I never did figure it out, really. I mean, I it's just it. kind of self serendipity. Things kind of fell in place, and I've had a, well, yeah, I get it. Had thus far a beautiful life professionally in terms of family life and all of that, but I'm telling you the truth. I never really... You know, I looked at friends of mine that had, by the time we were 22, 23, looked like they had the roadmap. Man, I, you know, I just I like didn't that. have a clue. Yeah. And, and I think that was part of the problem that my father just saw me being all over the place. And like, look, you got to decide something <laughs> instead of just being up in my house, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think Particularly, I think that is a very important, I had a long discussion with my sister about, we have a niece who's 25 and she's struggling a little bit, trying to find mm -hmm. herself. She's fine, I mean, she finished school, but she doesn't really, you know, she's, her mother thinks she's silly. And mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, if it's that or if it's just, if, if, if when I came up, I had all of the information that's hitting these kids. These kids get hit for more information in 10 minutes than we used to get in a whole day. That's so, so I mean, we could be wise. I really feel for them. And as an educator, I can see, I can see the change in how students yeah. out there that were waters come to college, ain't got no clue, mm -hmm. graduating and ain't got no clue. Right. And it's not because they're not bright or don't want, it's just, it's just so much. <coughs> To, to try to wrap yourself around. Information overload. Yeah. Mm. So for me, it was just trying to figure it out. And thank God, at least I figured out how to pay my rent. 
<laughs> How to pay what now? Pay my rent and my right, mortgage. Right, I, you right, know, right. I figured that out. Right. So I wouldn't, you know, but growing right. up really is the, is, the, is the statement. Just I wish I had matured earlier than what I did. And, and, and I want to piggyback on that. And when you mentioned that, I thought about that for myself. Um, I feel I was a late bloomer in so many areas. And, uh, but now I would tell my younger self, and even, even now, um, just trust the process and don't be afraid to fail. Uh, trust the process and then, and then trust God. And my, to my younger self, probably uh, commit to the Lord uh, at a much younger age. Yes. Uh, at a much yeah. younger age. Yeah. And, and that fear, that, that fear of God at, at a yeah. much, in my, because you know, in your 20s, you're invincible. 18, 19, 20, you're the, y'all, you all remember. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing could go wrong. We had it all. And, you know, but uh, if, I, if I could go back, I would say stay the course. And I always tell myself now that the tortoise, the tortoise still wins. You know? That's one of my personal philosophy. Don't worry about who's the who's here, who's doing this, that, and the other. Just slow and steady still wins the still wins. Quote unquote wins this game or the game of life. So that's what I would probably tell my younger self. And my greatest challenge for me would be, yeah, just trust the process. Just trust that wherever you are, that God's got you. God is with you no matter what you're going through. Just trust that, that, that you're in the right place at the right time. Well, let me can I yeah, go ahead, Doc. I, I just want to just t touch on that point just very briefly. Yeah. I got called to preach when I was 15 years old. Wow. I didn't answer the call until I was 32 or 33, somewhere mm -hmm. along in there. Yes, I ran sir. from it. Now, I knew I was running from it, mm. but I didn't have enough. I knew I had a faith walk, but I didn't have enough behind me to be able to know he ain't left me yet. I mean, I'm unemployed right now. He ain't left me all this time. Right, so, that's right. But I wasn't able mm. to say that when I was 25 years old. I mean, I could say it, but it wasn't authentic. You know, right, right. I hadn't been through nothing. My parents had took care of me up until college was over with. So I, I really had not stood on my feet and fallen down on my face, had to get up on my own and all that kind of thing, and saw the Lord work in my life until much later. So now, you know, if I was in my financial situation, it ain't bad, but it's challenging. 30 years ago, I'd be freaked out. But now I'm like looking at, you know, I'm saying, well, all this, all these years, he ain't left me yet. He ain't gonna Right, there you go. There you go. You know. Truly, truly walking by faith and not by sight. Amen. Sorry to butt in, but I just. No, no, no. That's all that's important because. Uh... You know, everything you guys says make me realize how closely linked some of our experiences, although these experiences are uh, somewhat different. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Uh, and I was always a very curious person, but I was the oldest child in the family. So, you know, being the oldest puts a, a, a bit of pressure on you in some ways, mm -hmm. but in some ways, uh, you know, your siblings challenge you all the time and they look up at you all the time. Uh, and the expectation from your parents, you know, uh, is high. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I started out before Reverend Calhoun, when I heard Larry, I just wanted to assure him that he's not the only one that have had failure in marriage. I had a couple of myself. Amen. The yeah. first one, I went off to college and, and was applying to med school, and oops. And I came home and I told my mother, and she said, when you get back, you better be married. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm not going to expound that on, on that anymore. We got you. But it, those types of things that occur in life, uh, forces you to be resilient and it challenges the, the, the pre-thoughts you have when you're young 
And my father was a take no prisoner type of thing. He said, the only thing I promised you was was to get you out of high school. You're on your own. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I said, Pops, I only need uh, 250 bucks. He said, well, there's a job waiting on you. You can do that or you can go to school. And I just uh, went on to grad, uh, to, to grad school knowing that I didn't have any money. And when I got there, praise the Lord. They knew me mm -hmm. and, and had the money for me. And uh, I deferred going to medical school because of this new thing, this doctor of pharmacy thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. left my family behind because all I could see is, wow, I don't want to be one of those guys regretting that you didn't finish your education and you had a mortgage. But uh, I said all that to say that I have, for a long time, believed that we've got to change the way that we raise our sons. Mm -hmm. We've got to spend more time sharing these relationships that we've come to know with the Lord to them at an early stage. Well, Regardless of whether they want to hear it or not, we have to insist. And I can tell you, these are challenging times. I just got my last two out. And uh, when you got an educated woman in the house, they're taking up and saying you don't want to be too hard on your sons. But I, my, I keep reminding my wife, my experiences, my experiences from my father, so right. I'm transferring that good stuff to my sons. Don't interfere with that. <laughs> <laughs> so Larry, I can understand. And, 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 and it leaves a void in your heart. And I don't think a lot of ladies realize that, that men love their children just as much as they do. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, Lamar, they, you, they don't don't, want, you don't want to be separated from your children. Right. right. You, you don't want to. And many women feel that because the child came from their birth canal, that child is closer to them than it ever could be to you which is a fallacy. So that's another conversation. Oh, so yeah. um, the, the, the question was asked is, so what's been the biggest challenge of your life? And, and, and I submit to you gentlemen, for me, it was college. Um, the reason I say that is I, I in high school, I, I took college preparatory classes. Why? Uh, for the life of me, I, I still don't know. Um, mom told me, I want you to go to college. Uh, at that point, pops had a sixth grade education and mom uh, she went back and got her high school diploma after um, after we came to after they came to Jacksonville, but but going off to college, um, I, I didn't know. So here I was, um, 18 years old, going off to the University of Florida and immersed into a white culture. And uh, as a freshman that summer, they were saying, "Hey, look, Larry, we're having a daiquiri party. Why don't you come? A daiquiri party? Sure." Now, the first thing is, what's the daiquiri? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. What, what are daiquiris? So, so now, okay, I'm, I'm, okay, here, Larry, here's some daiquiris. I'm drinking them. Okay. And then I go to a fraternity party. And after drinking daiquiris, my brother, I'm, I'm asking my brother, where is the men's restroom? And he sends me to a girl's bathroom. And I see white girls come in the bathroom while I'm using it. And, and these things are all new. And they're wow. To me, but the biggest thing is so, what are you going to do? What are you going to major in? Oh, no. I wasn't introduced to various professions, and now I looked at my brother, and, and he, what? He's going to be an electrical engineer. Cool. That's what I'm going to be. He'll be like my brother. Not knowing what an engineer does, not knowing the concepts, not knowing the technology, not knowing anything about engineering other than that's what my brother's going to be. And it was tough. Um, it, it was real tough trying to get through those classes. I didn't graduate cum laude. I graduated old laude. Old laude, <laughs> let this child graduate. So it was, it, it was tough, I, I can honestly say, but it was one of the best times I had in my life um, in a worldly sense. I had a good time, but it was a hard time getting that degree. So that was, that was a tough time for me. 
my challenge, my challenge was, was uh, uh, going back going to what back I talked what about talk earlier, about. Uh, the fact that back my dad, dad was uh, self-employed. Self -employed. And, you know, and, you know he, he, he did seasonal, he did seasonal work, work as a as contractor. contractor. Worked outside, worked outside. it was warm and relatively, relatively dry. dry, worked inside, inside. when it was cold. cold. And, uh, and uh, we grew up we grew with a with sense, sense of, of an enormous, enormous abundance, abundance of intellectual, intellectual and spiritual, spiritual resources. Resource. And, and as, as we shared, shared with Larry, Larry, the whole idea, the idea of going to college, college wasn't, wasn't whether, whether I could I handle, handle it, but whether, but whether I, could I could afford, afford. it. And so, and so I, I used to, used to have to have constantly to push myself, myself against, against the, the, the tide, the tide uh, of, of where you're going to get, you the, gonna money, get the money uh, uh, to do to these do things, things, even though I had a wherewithal to accomplish. To accomplish. And, so and so that, that, was, that, was, that something was something that, that, that I had to deal with. Uh, 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 like Lamar like was saying, saying when, I, when I arrived, I arrived at my graduate, graduate school, school, I had $4 dollars out of pocket. At, 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 at Wilberforce, and, and, uh, and uh, but I made but my, I made trick, my trick now to the financial aid office, and they had they had it for it. So, so again, again, not being not aware of all these things, things uh, because, of, because that, of that material, material and economic, economic scarcity, scarcity that I experienced, experienced as, as, as a child. Child, uh, uh, it, it just it just it just made it made it something I something always, I always had, had to push against. against. So that it would not prevent me from achieving my goals and my dreams. Okay. Um, that was great. Thank you, sir. Um, favorite scripture, favorite Bible narrative? Anybody got one? I do. Oh, yeah. We, I, I'm sure we all got, got, got at least two or three. Uh -huh. uh, um, Perhaps since one I that Since I didn't answer the last question, I'm going to answer it in this question. Okay. And um, I would have to say, the first one, of course, is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mm -hmm. And then, as I have grown older in life, uh, I was going to say my biggest challenge yes, sir. then and now is getting out of and staying out of God's way. Amen. The Amen. second verse that I wanted to share with you all, I'm sure uh, a few of us know it already, is Ecclesiastes 12th chapter. And I tell my sons all the time as they get older, you know, remember who brought you here. Remember who created you, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially as you are young, remember that. So hopefully you can grow old. And... Uh, that's it for me. Yeah, yeah. Those, those two uh, verses. Yeah. So for me, I want to piggyback on what the brother was saying. Is um, it, the the two scriptures, passage of scriptures that we learned earlier in life, uh, came from Matthew the sixth chapter, and it came from Psalms the twenty third chapter. We know Matthew the sixth chapter started off as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father who art in heaven. I'm pretty sure. So we, I didn't know too much growing up other than our Father who art in heaven. And as we get to this Father's Day, I'm telling people, our Father, if, if we treat our Father like our children treated us, maybe we'll be better off, some of us. Anyway, some of our children treat us like, I'm not going to talk about it. But then... <laughs> The 23rd Psalm, that's gotten me through a lot of points in life. Just reciting that scripture while I'm in bad times and while I'm in good, that scripture has gotten me through a lot of things. And so for me, those two passages of scripture have been my favorite. Well, I've got a lot of favorites, obviously, you know, being a being in ministry, but but I if I had to pick 
1. It would probably be Mark 10, 45. It's at the end of the story of the sons of Zebedee when they had asked Jesus, could they sit at his right and left hand in glory? Uh -huh. and the Lord told them they didn't know what they were asking because they didn't know if they could, do, could can you drink from the cup I've got to drink? Right. And he ended that with saying, for the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that, Amen. that the Latin translation of that actually was the motto of my high school. And my high school principal, who was a priest, an Episcopal priest, really did model that for us. And that just has always probably been first sermon I ever preached after I got ordained. I preached that, that story. Sons of Zebedee, I'll never forget it. I preached at Washington Chapel AME Church, Tuskegee, Alabama, 1986. I'll never forget that. <laughs> Bishop Davis was pastor in that church at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, Bishop Davis was, the, you know, he was Reverend Davis then. But anyway, that is a great, um, speaks to me as not just something that, I, but also just as a way if we could think about our lives, mm -hmm. if we could think about ourselves as a servant, and you'd be surprised how in, in a spirit of service, you get you think you done bless somebody else, you get far more blessings that come back to you. So anyway, so that's my favorite. Well, I know the pastor said, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The pastor said uh, a scripture or a narrative, and so I, I selected the narrative, um, and, and the Bible narrative is the story of Joseph, and Amen. what I appreciate about the story is that Joseph, being a younger sibling, and I was the youngest of all of my siblings, and coming from a large family, uh, I ended up being the only male child, so I got a lot of things kind of shifted my way. So it did appear at times I was being, you know, play, I was, I was, they were playing favorites a bit, but it wasn't so much they were playing favorites. I was only male, so there were certain things that could only be mine. And so uh, my, my older female siblings didn't always want to go along with that plan. But uh, what I love about the Joseph story is that he, he shows us that in different situations in life, uh, when someone is, is ready to threaten these unique dreams that you may have, and like Calhoun going up there in, 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 in North Alabama, uh, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't pronounce words too clearly sometimes because folks would say you were talking proper. Right. So, had to be careful just the way you presented yourself but occasionally it would it would slip out that you were a little different that and your and your teachers and the principal of the elementary school would kind of hone in on you and say boy you look like you you trying to do something different special with your life so that's what i liked about the story of joseph that joseph had these unique gifts this unique ability and it shifted his position in the family and it, that's the exact same thing that has happened to me over the course of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. My sisters, my older siblings, uh, early into my 30s, started coming to me. <laughs> and and uh, it, it was just a fascinating thing. And, and even as a young boy, they would use me to uh, evaluate their boyfriend choices. So, uh, most of them tried to impress me with toys and taking me to McDonald's and stuff like that. But there was only one thing they had to do, and that was take me downtown Florence, Alabama, on Court Street, to a place called Trowbridge's Ice Cream. Yes, sir. And if they could figure that out, I would give them a thumbs up. Most of them failed, and I gave them a thumbs down. But it, it was interesting that the role has shifted over the course of the years that my older siblings seek me out uh, for direction for themselves, for their children and their grandkids and so forth. And um, so the Joseph story really, really connects with me well. 
Um, I guess my favorite story would be David and Goliath. As soon as I yeah. found out I was a giant, I was curious from then on out. But um, another story I really appreciate is in Acts chapter 27. Um, when Paul gets trapped in a storm, the storm is actually called the Arachnidon. It's a, um, I think it's like a hurricane that ends up happening in the Mediterranean Sea. But um, storms always give you a good concept of life. Um, it's a lot of stories in the Bible about storms. But at the end, of, you know, you can always see the end because the storm's going to end. Um, and so that's, that's those are some of my favorite stories. The curiosity that the Bible puts in for you to research other things. Um, so that's it. I like that. I like that, brother. Charles, let me just slip in here and say one quick thing. Um, that's been mine about the storms. Of course, being around my father, he's always tell me, son, this too shall pass. Mm. So whatever's going on in your life, the chaos, that this too shall pass. And the other thing I like was, um, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. When I get my, when my back is against the wall, when uh, I'm a day late and a dollar short, you know, I will not give in. I will not give up. That I can do all things through Christ Jesus, who strengthens me, and that's carried me a long way. Even in the midst of perceived failure, I fall back on that, and that, that tends to keep me uh, focused. Somebody was about to say something. Go ahead. I cut someone off. That's all right. I was about to say something. I said I kind of wrap two and three together in okay. somewhat of a narrative and. And some of you I've shared this with, but uh, when I was at historic and went to Sunday school, I remember the story of Solomon. Mm. And when I got home, I don't, I don't guess I was more than five or six or whatever it was. I got on my knees and said, hey, Lord, help me be like Solomon. <laughs> I, I was so impressed with that Sunday school lesson. And so the narrative is the, the Lord was pleased with Solomon and asked him what he wanted. <laughs> Solomon said wisdom. And the Lord in Chronicles says, uh, because you didn't ask for wealth, you didn't right. ask to destroy your enemies, right. you just want wisdom so that you could properly rule your people. I'm going to, to bless you with wisdom. But as a caveat, he got the things he didn't ask for either. <laughs> he became the wisest man, the richest man, <laughs> and had all of these things. And, uh, you know, it's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah. And I can remember uh, growing up, I used to get teased because they were the only quiet place you could find in the house when you got five siblings was the restroom. So when I had to go, I'd take, I'd take a different letter of the encyclopedia and I would try to read the whole darn thing. I would look for special people in that encyclopedia and I'd just say, hey boy, this guy was something else. You know, this dude was something else. Oh, man, you know, I just couldn't wait to just discover something. So one of the things that I, I try to do is learn something new every day. So this is really a blessing because uh, it's like having uh, five or six big brothers that you can just talk to and share. And that's the one thing that is compelling to me. I always said, you know, there's more for us to talk about than when I was growing up under the oak tree about <laughs> the shape of the girls and who had the, the, the best clothes and shoes. It's the kind of thing that I used to hear all the time and I go, oh, man, that's all they think about. <laughs> so this is really great, you know, really great to be, be able to share. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else want to share? Brother Charles? You good? Everybody good? Okay. Um, Brother uh, Williams had to step away for a moment, so we're going to continue on. Um, you know, so much is going on, brothers. What's, what's some of your uh, your thoughts on Black Lives Matter, mm. with the police brutality? Um, I know we've all been there. We've been uh, the only um, African-American in a meeting, the only African-American on our jobs, perhaps. 
perhaps maybe the only uh, manager or, or supervisor we've been, um, you know, the only one in the room. And uh, we've, we've experienced a lot, perhaps our own racism. Uh, what has it been like for you all over the years? And uh, what are your thoughts on, on this new paradigm shift and awareness of uh, Black Lives Matter? So I'm, I, I, I'd like to go first because I may have to uh, bow out again shortly. Yes, sir. No. But uh, I have to, to be honest and say that I've been blessed. I've not had in my lifetime uh, any encounters with the law. Uh, I've not been out of bounds with them. So anytime I was stopped for either speeding or maybe perhaps running a red light, uh, I mean a stop sign or something of that nature, it all came out fairly well for me. But I have experienced racism throughout my life, not myself, but I've observed it. I've seen it. The, the military was laden with it, the Army. And now as I work for the Navy, it's, it, it, it's rampant throughout. And as for the profession, in emergency management, there are not very many African-American males uh, that choose that route. Many are qualified, but few choose that route. Um, and I try to raise my, my son's understanding this, that if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. And most of the protesters are protesting, but they've got to get beyond the protest and become part of the solution. Because right now, the protesting is part of the problem. Uh, because they're tearing up, destruct, uh, destroying everything, and people are getting hurt. Yes. That, that's a price to pay, understood. But I'll be glad when they get to the the the, the peace table, and, and we can all come together and make you know resilient communities because it's still possible. Racism is not going anywhere. We're not going to eradicate that. It's going to always be around. I think one of the things that uh, I appreciate what you said, brother, brother Wynn. One of, one of the things that I occurs to me in this chapter, and uh, Reverend Taylor mentioned it, but I grew up in Alabama when George Wallace was oh, sick and dogs. I mean, you know, yeah. Bull Con and all of them. And I participated in that. And, and, and I, didn't, I didn't go to Birmingham and get no dogs sick on me, but we certainly wow. marched and had yeah. all kinds of stuff. But this iteration, I think this time, uh, <clears throat> I think has in, enlightened not just black folk who needed to be enlightened, mm -hmm. but also many people of all walks of life, white folk in particular, mm -hmm. who never understood the privilege that they have just by virtue of their birth. Talk to me. And never, and I, and, but what I'm saying is even as somebody who marched and did all of these things back in King, I went to the settlement of Montgomery March. I was personally there. Yeah saw Martin Luther King stand on those steps and say, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming. I saw that with my own eyes, right. sitting on daddy's shoulders. I right. never forget. But let me tell you something. Privilege has run so deep for so long till we knew that the Klan may come out there and burn a cross. But That's we right. didn't understand privilege in its subtleties, uh -huh. like why somebody just graduate from school, your classmate, and go get a $80,000 job, and you run. Oh, no, no. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, sir. Didn't, yes, sir. Wasn't a good student, wasn't a, but knew somebody. Daddy mm -hmm. was already there. These mm -hmm. kinds of things. So you got this in their mind. Y'all saw the vice president of the United States refuse to say Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Now, uh, the vice president, the vice president Pence said, would not say it in an interview. This was just yesterday. Would not it's say just, Black Lives Matter. All Lives Matter. 
So what it does is it decontextualizes you and mm, mm, will yeah, mix uh, you in. Uh -huh. Well, once we get mixed in, we already second class. Uh -huh. And it's not, anyway, I, I can go on about it forever. But no, I no, think, no, no. But, but, I, but I do think that maybe we have a new chapter now and a new, hopefully, a new awareness. I appreciate what Brother, Brother Williams, I appreciate what you said about coming to the peace table because this will calm down in the streets. But if we don't change some things, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's you know, uh, and have a sustained thing, we will gravitate back to those comfort zones because they got a hundred generations of being in charge and having privilege, and we got a hundred generations of being okay. not in charge and being subservient. Yes. Yeah. So let me. We have can to I pick up about how to have that mindset too. Hold on, Charles. Go ahead. I'm through. Thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Brother Taylor. Go ahead, Brother Charles. All right, so when he was talking about mixing in, um, mm -hmm. let's get an understanding of what Black Lives Matter and when they first pop up. They first popped up in, I guess, with the shooting of Mike Brown in Flint, right. Michigan. Uh -huh. um, at that point, they were useful. The use of Black Lives Matter is basically like a meme, like some you text somebody. Um, but it, it, it's a great it's a great understanding of it, it, it's a great way to capture what we go through. But largely, it's a it's a leaderless move, movement right now. Um, what you see is, you know, these mixed crowds of people. It could be broken down into three different parts of of the protesters, that group that are actually protesting for police brutality and the overarching, you know, get trying to get free and released from white supremacy. Um, and then you got other people that are just take advantage of the moment. Yeah. And and like he said, we gotta have some kind of separation from from what's the focus gonna be at the end of this. And we got to keep that energy going because at this point, um, the protesters are saying th the ones that are there that are protesting for the right manner are saying that we, if we want you to live under the same laws that we live under. Mm -hmm. Right now, we live in the most incarcerated state there has ever been. The United States of America incarcerates more people than there are women incarcerated globally around the world. The incarcerated the rates that we experience in America are, are like you've never seen before. Um, it's something close, the only thing you can kind of compare it to is what happened Af in, in, in South Africa after the apartheid, mm. or during the apartheid. Mm. That's the only way we can compare the amount of money that the U.S. government placed into this incarceration state. Amen. Um, take for example, um, Floyd, George Floyd. I think he moved there around 1994. Um, there was a bill that was passed in 1994 by Joe Biden called the 94 Crime Act. That 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 Crime Act helped fund this incarceration state that we're staying over staying in right now that we're living under um during that time he was able to add 1200 new police officers to milwaukee uh that's minneapolis so 1200 new police officers were in that area able to answer those calls and able to almost put down like a nazi germany type effect in every city across america I can remember two times coming out of historic Mount Zion and being pulled over. Um, my wife worked as a secretary there at the church. And because there's so many homeless people in downtown Jacksonville at this point, um, I pulled out to go to the Shell gas station that's right down the street. The police saw me pull out of the church. The, all the homeless people there began to scatter because they don't have a place downtown Jacksonville where they can sit in peace. And at that point, he jumped behind me, 
assumed I was selling drugs to that group of people instead of dropping my wife off to the church and returning to make sure she was safe at that church. So my, my experience, I guess, growing up in the 90s and the 2000s was far different with the number of police that were on the streets during that time. Um, it was almost like skipping a rock that you would go get put in the back of a police car that day. Yeah, pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. And, and so you can you can see nothing has ch much has changed since since then, yeah. uh, brother Charles and all of us uh, who are on this platform uh, this evening have gone through similar situations um, at work. Um, I got pulled over a couple of times coming from Lake City, um, pastoring. My headlight was out, and and I felt like I got harassed. You know, and at that time, I I, uh, I had a cell phone. I turned my cell phone on, and I said, I said, Dad, I want you to know, got the police just pulled me over. He said, Keep the cell phone on, son. He says, Shut your mouth, and put your hands on the steering wheel. So I knew his 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 thing was he wanted me to come home alive, and that happened probably in two thousand and um, I don't know five, two thousand five, six and one on that. So. Um, and to see where we are today, it's disheartening to know that we're still going through it. And I was touched last two weeks ago, I, uh, brothers, I was having a conversation with uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, not Taylor, Dr. Calhoun, and he shared with me that his father put him in the car one afternoon or one day and drove he and his, I guess, siblings. Am I correct? That's right. Me and would, my you, would you just yeah? Would you just tell that brief story and it, that that touched me? Well, they had done a cross burning, and it was out in the rural area of Macon County, Alabama, and there had been a cross burning by the KKK in the in the yard of a black family, right. and my father wanted us to see that the rim, the, the the charred cross was still out in the yard. He drove us right. out in the country to see that. I never will forget it. And it terrorized that family. And they left and moved to Detroit or somewhere. I mean, they left within 24 hours. They were gone. Mm -hmm. And of course, people that knew them were just, everybody was horrified by that. You know, they got up out of there. They, they felt yeah. like they were getting ready to be killed. You know, that was a warning. If you yeah. don't get out of, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's, 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 that's deep. Brother Charles, thank you for sharing, brother. Uh, Calhoun, thank you for sharing, uh, Brother Charles. Well, I thank God that you're alive right now, um, especially in the general. You represent, uh, you was you in your 30s? Yeah. Brother Charles? Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm 39, so. 39, so yeah, we thank God that you're alive. Uh, they were shooting brothers then, and we didn't hear about it. Now we're hearing about it. And because we have the video cameras and all the phones, but thank God that you're here to talk about it. I was telling um, one of the two of the brothers here on, the, on this platform that I remember back in 2007, my father's uh, cousin was visiting here in Jacksonville and my dad wanted me to meet uh, Uncle uh, Cousin Luke. And my father at the time, he said, Luke, tell my boy about my father because my father did not know his dad. He, yeah, my, my father did not know his father. And he said, Cousin Luke, tell my son a, a little bit about my father. Tell him how he died in this car accident. So all my father's life, this was in 2007, he found this out. Found out. Anyway, Luke says, Calvin says, son, your father didn't uh, die in an auto accident. He said, those white folks hung your daddy. And you should have saw the look on my father's face. Yeah. And I remember sitting there and I started crying. I thought about it because all these years we've been told the narrative that granddaddy Cole died in an auto accident in Philadelphia, but he was <clears> hung. <throat> and so uh, that, that affected me greatly. So that, that I've always been kind of mad about that in mm -hmm. a sense. So we each have that, 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 that uh, hit and rage to mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that rage, but that all lives matter, that black lives matter. And um, at the same time, we want to present the best that we can be uh, when we are within our own community as well as in the uh, larger community. So, um, 
and to know that's still going on is just disheartening and I'm just hurt by what I see today with all the killings. And um, as my father would tell me now, if he was alive now, he would say, son, this too shall pass. I know it looks bad, um, but it's going to get better. And he would always tell me, what you see is the 49%. The 51% is better than that. And even at 95, two years ago, he died two years ago at 95. He would always say that. He would talk about um, uh, the boys with the pants down. I said, oh, daddy, guys doing this, the young people this. He said, son, don't be distracted by all that you see. That's only 49%. The 51%. Look at yourself. Look at your your your, your friends. Look at your, uh, uh, brother Larry Major. Look at Bill Lamar. Look at so I said, yeah, Dad, you're right. You're right. You call. Say so you start calling out the name. So, but I want us to be encouraged with all that we see. Anybody else want to make a comment about Black Lives no, Matter? I, I would. Go ahead. If if I may. Um, Go ahead. And I don't want to go back over some of the other comments, but. I want to lift what my thoughts were from a different perspective. And I said, our society are highlights and put into the spotlight that we have a, a corrupt culture. Okay. Even though some of us recognize that, in a way, our silence collaborates it. Mm -hmm. We have so many churches, so many ministers, and yet our God is a God of justice. Mm -hmm. So how in the Dickens in 2020, mm. we find it necessary to be out protesting for basic human rights in a society mm -hmm. that a lot of countries look up to. Mm -hmm. How do we allow a president who is, I have no other word for it, is evil. Amen. Amen. But we don't have the courage to call him out on it. This explosive book that one of his cabinet members just got the pre- court just ruled that he can mm -hmm. publish the book. Mm -hmm. Here we got a guy who's committing treason in his office with the Chinese and with most dictators. Help me win the election and I'll allow you to imprison Muslims, put them in concentration camps, but you see, we focus a lot of time on what happened to black folk, but a lot of folks in this country, they had something on PBS with the Chinese, with the uh, Japanese, were put in concentration camps here, in turn. And matter of fact, some of our friends may be mixed from the soldiers who came back and we grew up with folks in that was mixed heritage, but we don't understand the complexity of that. Mm -hmm. But because of percentage of your blood, you're treated a certain way and certain fractions of our society will dismiss the fact that they're black. But I'm on the impression that God doesn't care what color you are. He wants to save all of us, but we don't have the moral character to challenge this Amen. behavior that goes on. Amen. And because of it, the evilness that has persisted for so long, a lot of our children and relatives don't believe in God because of it. Mm. And if I'm telling you the truth. That's good. That's good. Uh, they yeah. don't because they see, uh, they see folks who, who, Hold on, Charles. We're coming. who don't walk the walk that they preach. Okay, mm -hmm. but my thing is, just like with anything you do, there's a prejudice, and one person or one group can't change it. It takes all of us, but we have to get back to the fact that 
our creator created us for a specific reason and he has ex uh, expectations for us we need to call what we're going through in our society for what it is mm. Amen. a lot of people are just becoming aware of what happened in tulsa oklahoma right you see but that has happened in florida that's right bro. And there are a lot of things that haven't even been recorded that happened. And I can also remember when we were in segregation, because I was born in 51, here in Jacksonville, you had a separate black police force. Mm -hmm. And those guys didn't play. But my parents and most of our parents would say, hey, don't you get in any trouble and don't mm -hmm. you go to jail. I'm not going to get you out. Mm -hmm. They make sure you go to church and they make sure that you understand what God's standard was. And that's what got us through. I think that's what Calvin is saying. Now, I think the biggest issue is in terms of race relation is if we don't communicate and share, because I've been the first two, the first thing I tell groups when I'm leading or I'm in a group is that, hey, we all want the same thing for our children and our family. We are no different. Uh, so I'm not going to be angry with you because you're privileged. I'm just going to try to use this opportunity to give my children some of the same privilege that you've assumed all along. So don't assume that my education is less than yours because all of us have been uh, victimized by not having true American history because if we did, they would, everybody would know about what happened in Tulsa. Oklahoma. Well, well, but we're all part of that as it develops every century, every decade, every century. Uh, blacks are going to be part of uh, uh, racism history because racism isn't going to go away because as long as you have people who are racist, okay, Caucasian, no, that. That, that don't want to accept the fact that we're, we're all equal, you know, and, and, and so you, you really have to get around that. You, you, you know what the problem is, it's been around for a while, it continues to happen to this day, to this minute, to this uh, uh, moment. Uh, so what's the fix? The fix is really trying to get those folks who are perpetrating those uh, 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 types of crimes, all right, to see life differently. And I'm sorry, but that is going to have to take divine intervention. Nobody down here <laughs> on this plane is going to stop that. You know, no matter how much they come to the table, there's going to be a few left back up against the wall that are still going to feel the way that they feel. So we have that's to. That's, that's not where I was going with it. I was going to say, uh, the other part of it is, uh, we are forced to learn the tragedies and the histories of other people where tragedies happen outside of our country. All your children, all of us know about the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. But well, what about the stuff that has happened here? The people and who are already think, born here. I don't think that we're the problem. I think they, whoever they are, other than who we, you know, have come to know they to be, all right, they are the problem. And and, and uh, no matter how much you tell them, I, I told they uh, had a conversation, and I rarely do this uh, uh, on the job, um, especially something as high, high visibility as this. But he asked me, he said, well, what do you think about it, uh, Mr. Williams? I said, well, I'll just tell you this. Most black folk that I know, all right, don't have time to run around trying to uh, lynch and, and, and kill white people. They just don't have time to do that. They're concerned with surviving. You know, they're concerned with doing what they can for their communities. Many of them are still in need of, of making some improvements, but we just don't have time to go around perpetrating those crimes. You know, I appreciate this diversity of thought. I want to hear from uh, Brother Charles to cut him off. 
want to hear from uh, yeah. your, some of your thoughts. Um, so I want to be really, really specific about who did this occur to and why it occurred. When you look at Sandra Bland, the Trayvon, the Mike Brown, and then you have Ahmaud Arbery, and then we have a few from the, I guess the guy that got killed in the apartment, I can't remember his name, by Amber Geiger, um, who were, were not descended from this, from this group of people. Um, I think we're too broke of a group to begin to talk about other groups of people. And we got to keep our focus on ourselves. Um, the average black American only got $1,700 worth of wealth. We have little time, I guess, not to be worried about those men where this tragedy occurred. Um, and that's why I push back against the whole Black Lives Matter thing. Um, it's, a, it's a leaderless organization right now. They're going to get a lot of money right now. Whoever those leaders that emerge from it, um, largely charity is not going to help us get out of this. We need large transformational government to go in and root out the people in these police departments that have these ideas, that have been planted with these ideas, um, that we are less than people. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes from our background, and that comes from where we descend from slavery. And when I watch Ahmaud Arbery, um, I remember me and my dad dog hunting in Woodbine, Georgia, which is not long or far away from Brunswick, Georgia. That reminded me of when we used to have to catch the dog. I run. And I've always thought, I used to run about 10 o'clock at night. My wife thought it was ridiculous. Yeah. I always had in the back of my mind, it was a black person that was going to kill me a white person. And to see that, it, it shook me to the core. So now I run with AA. I, I run with Amari Ivory every day now. And that's sad to have to say. Um, but it, like, like, like Calvin said, it's going to have to be that group of people that make the change. Because these ideas are being duplicated through two institutions to me, the family and the white church. Until the white church gets involved and says, we cannot reproduce this type of male mm. that is afraid of us reproducing and becoming greater people. Um, until the US government says, you're gonna do the same amount of time that my friends had to do for similar marijuana charges, drug charges, mm -hmm. and, and for capital murder that day, that right. some of my friends, I guess, so they're gonna have to share in the cost. And until that, and that's why those 51%, like Pat say, 51% of those people that are in the streets have got to remain in the streets and they can't look like us. So I appreciate those protesters that yeah. are going out there, they're outraged, they gotta stay in the streets because at this point, those police have got to be charged. They got to be charged to the max. They got to set a precedent that scared the other police from joining yeah, yeah. the police departments across America. Well, police and citizens, white citizens as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You see it yeah. from the Tra Trayvon Martin and now Amar Aubrey. It's got to be a precedent um, because at the end of the day, they know what we descend from. They remember three fifths. And they know they can get, get away with it. Yeah, um, yeah. It's no this, measure of a man to be fully adjusted to a sick society. Yeah. Um, I, I, had, I was curious, Pastor, mm -hmm. why do you think they hid the language of lynching to go as far as to describe it as your, your family? Why, did, why do you think they went to those extent? I don't know if it was what degree did they go and why do you think they hid it like that from you? Why would they that's say a, that? That's a, um, oh gosh, that's another discussion and mm. another, uh, I would love to tell you that and we can get into that, but it's been an hour and a half almost. I love, I want to continue this conversation. So I'm thinking for part two, 
we can focus on Black Lives Matter, police, police brutality, and uh, one other question. So um, we can talk more about that. I'll tell you about that on a, on a, off the, off the um, platform. But I want to thank everyone for this rich discussion. I value you, my brothers. I love you in the Lord. Um, I just cannot express what this means to me. I'm like Brother uh, Lamar. This means so much to me. And the richness of the conversation, the wisdom that I'm looking at over this, this screen. I thank my brother Larry, my high school friend. I'm tearing up when I look at the hearing um, this rich conversation. And, and as we close, you all, we all are the 51%. And we should be part of the change. And Brother uh, Brown, you struck a chord with me about the white church. What, what angers me is that the white church is not involved uh, with the um, black churches of African American churches on the front line that I, that I don't know of. That they may be, but I haven't heard. No. And why, why aren't they involved yeah, in the no. conversation? They read the same Bible. They understand the, uh, they have the same understanding of creation. No. And they understand uh, the cradle of civilization. So I don't know. I do understand why, because power never gives up power. They go. Met somebody. Yeah. And you're talking to somebody that said earlier, years, years of oppression, years. And I believe they are operating, I believe my, our white brothers and sisters are operating out of fear. They're operating out of fear, and that's a sin. And that's that's a sin, and I believe that all with all with all my heart. So we're going to end this conversation today. I want to continue this on in part two. If you all will join me, and we continue this conversation about the measure of a man and Black Lives Matter throughout the month of June. So continue to put on your thinking caps. I uh, love you in the Lord, and uh, God bless you. Yeah, One you. last word. Um, I, I got to do this for everyone. Just one word and whatever. If you could interview or have a conversation with someone from the past, who would that one person be? And um, you can answer the why in part two. Jesus. If you could interview someone from the past, Jesus. who would that one person be? All right. Uh, Go ahead, somebody else. For me. I would say Jesus also, but I thought Certainly, Jesus, but Booker T. Washington. Okay. Ah, yes, that's okay. yes, yes, yes. I was going to right. say my maternal grandmother. Mm. Mm. She passed away uh, before my mother reached her sixteenth birthday, mm. and uh, mm. I saw pictures of her. She was she was one of these classic beauties. Um, mm. One of these people that had a stunning uh, appearance, you know, uh, a very classy uh, person. And I know some of what she taught my mother must have passed on. Yes, sir. Her. But I got to know my grandfather, but I would love to have gotten to know my maternal grandmother. I say uh, Gordon Park Sr. Mm. I want to interview, I guess, the the first slave that came over in my family line. Yes, sir. What happened, you know, and where he came from. Mm, that's what good. That's good. Brother Larry. For me, I would be, it would be my mother's father, my granddad. Mm -hmm. Yes, because he was, he was part of the, um, uh, part of the Masons, and he murdered a white man. Wow. He had to be carried out in a casket under a dead person to get away from white folks. So That's I would want to, yeah, want to interview mm -hmm. him. That's deep. That's deep. Thank you all so much. I guess for me, it would be uh, my father's father, Granddaddy Cole. Um, even in death, his, uh, his life speaks. Um, I've seen pictures of him dressed in a really nice suit, um, and I was told you know after the story with uh, brother charles that he probably thought he was bigger than he uh, one of the big negroes <laughs> and i believe he got murdered or hung for thinking uh more highly of himself 
um, he was an entrepreneur, and that entrepreneur spirit ran. My father inherited that, and my mother, and his mother, and it's all run throughout our, our, our bloodlines. So I would love to interview him as, as along with Jesus as well. But uh, I would love to just uh, have a conversation with him and what he had witnessed. Thank you, brothers. God bless you. God bless, brother. Happy Father's Day. You guys are wonderful God. role models. We love you in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hopefully I can calm down, Pastor. Calm down. Calm down, <laughs> brother. Okay. Stay focused. Thank God bless y'all. Bye-bye.